Hello, everyone, and welcome again. My name is Dr. Cheryl London, and I'm the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Education at Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine here at Tufts University. Welcome to the very first Cummings School Community Vet Talks. This event would not have been possible without the support of Bob Croce, a um, member of the Cummings School Board of Advisors and Chair of the Brighter World Campaign Committee, and Sally Croce, a member of the Campaign Committee. Thank you, Bob and Sally, for your generous contribution to making this evening possible. We envision this event as a nice way to show our community of pet parents, fellow faculty, students, and supporters around the country the incredible work happening behind the scenes in our clinics, classrooms, and laboratories each day at the coming school. Investing in our faculty and researchers who are driving discovery and passionately creating a healthier world for animals and people is incredibly important work. The eight women faculty that you will hear from tonight are truly outstanding scientists and clinicians. They are performing cutting edge work that has already impacted several areas of science and health, including clinical veterinary practice, infectious disease, genetics, and public health, among many other areas that are key parts of science and research. I have no doubt that they will continue to make significant contributions, and we are extraordinarily proud to have them as members of our Cummings community. I am so excited for them to share their stories with you tonight. Before I introduce our MC, I want to thank many of the members of the audience this evening who have made generous gifts to support Cummings School research. If you have not yet made a contribution, keep an eye out for opportunities for further engagement and support later this evening and in our follow-up email tomorrow. This event would also not have been possible without the mentorship and training from Mihir Makad, a professor of practice and leadership communication who has taught art of communication at the Tufts Fletcher and Friedman schools for the past decade. All of these institutions, at, at these institutions, he also launched, coached speakers for and, and um, emceed over a dozen beloved public speaking events entitled The Faces of Community and the Fletcher Ideas Exchange. Currently, he is teaching MBA students at the Indian School of Business and a diverse group of leaders around the world, including business executives, diplomats, lawyers, and many other professionals. Professor McGod has just published his first book entitled Minutes of Magic around communication impact, and he is completing his second book entitled Shine on Zoom. He just returned to the US after live anchoring the broadcast of the Tokyo Olympics in India to over 30 million viewers. We are so grateful that Dr. McCod was able to, Professor McCod was able to return virtually to Tufts to work with our faculty presenters over the past month. Mihir, take it away. Great, thank you very much. Dr. London, it's a real pleasure to continue to work uh, with students, faculty members in the community at Tufts. The eight faculty members who will be speaking today have spent quite a bit of time to bring you their life research. Well, today these researchers have 300 seconds. And for those 300 seconds, they've taken about five weeks to really go back to introspect, to see how they could bring their world and bring it alive for you in this time. Now, if, if we were in a live environment, I would try and get cheers from you and I'll get a sense of who's in the crowd. I'm assuming that there are students, there are alums, there are board members, there are donors potentially, and just well-wishers of the community. I hope after each talk, you will keep your enthusiasm and give them an applause, you know, even on mute uh, and in your minds. Okay, so with, without much more ado, let's get started. Now, our first speaker today is Dr. Emily McCobb, a superstar in her field. Dr. McCobb is a clinical associate professor of anesthesiology and the director of shelter and community medicine. Dr. McCobb's work spans access to care for low income and homeless pets, evidence-based approaches to shelter medicine, and the importance of the human-animal bond in the context of social justice. A speech tonight is entitled, and not surprisingly, Let People In, Increasing Access to Veterinary Care. Please, Emily. Thank you, Mahir. I grew up in a complicated, dysfunctional family. Multi-generational mental illness and alcoholism wove a complicated tapestry of highly charged interpersonal interactions punctuated by chronic emotional abuse, periodic, inner, periodic drama, and violence. In my family, children were to be seen and not heard, and that was fine by me. 
A shy, insecure, but overly functional child, I found solace in my love of animals, especially dogs. Now, I did not have a dog, but my grandmother did. On Thanksgivings, when we went to her big, white, scary house, you could find me outside with the dogs, throwing the ball for them, while everyone else was inside, arguing over dinner. Despite years of begging and several well-referenced research reports, my parents did not allow me to have a dog of my own. But then when I was 13 and they finally and thankfully decided to get divorced, that all changed. They promised I could get a puppy of my very own before my father moved away. And they actually stuck to that promise, even though she cost a whole $150. I took care of her and trained her myself and she became my best friend. Now it was the 1980s in suburbia. And as a nerdy kid from the wrong side of the railroad tracks with all the wrong clothes, I was far from popular and often lonely. But she was always there to cheer me up. When I later left for a summer in Europe and then to college, that dog kept my mother, a hater of dogs, from missing me too much. Two years later, when she was dying of metastatic breast cancer, the dog was the only thing that got my mother out of bed. Sybil would look at her with those big brown eyes and my mom would take her outside. After my mom passed away and I went back to college, my dog went to live with my boyfriend's family. When I then took their youngest child, now my husband, away from them all the way across the country to come here to Tufts, we left Sybil with them to make their nest a little less empty. Her whole life, that dog was just there for everyone who needed her. As I have gotten older, I have come to realize that although I've been dealt some bad cards, I have been very privileged. I never had to worry about where my next meal was coming from or where I would live. I couldn't always pay all my bills at the same time, but they always eventually got paid. I'm a white woman in a white woman's profession, but here in 2021, we can no longer ignore the historical inequities that keep veterinary medicine from being a more diverse and inclusive space where all types of people feel like they belong. All of us who have pets have stories like mine, stories of how our pets got us through the rough times. But despite their importance in our lives, not all pet owners can access all that they need for themselves and their pets. I believe that anyone should be able to have a pet if they want one and all pets deserve access to medical care. But my profession, veterinary medicine, has been set up to view pets as a luxury. Many veterinarians and animal lovers feel strongly that the ability to pay for veterinary care is somehow the marker of a good and responsible pet owner. But I don't wanna live in a world where only rich people can have pets. At the heart of my work is an effort to increase access to veterinary care. Veterinary care is expensive, as you will hear from some of my amazing colleagues tonight, we have advanced research-based treatment options, but we don't have a robust insurance system or well-established safety nets. I work with many clients who can't afford to spay or neuter their pets. Yet an unspayed female dog can develop a life-threatening uterine infection and require emergency surgery, which can cost over $4,000. Over a third of all Americans and half of Black Americans are financially unstable, meaning we can't come up with $2,000 in an emergency. Does that mean we should not have pets? What if we could come up with more efficient and cost-effective treatment options? My research shows that this same emergency surgery can be done by a supervised veterinary student in an outpatient community medicine clinic with nearly equal success, and we can charge far less. If we can bring the cost down, and empower our future graduates to provide basic care, we will be able to serve more pet owners. Our school invites students to consider their role in providing a range of care options within a spectrum of care. By opening the door to financially diverse clients, we are creating opportunities for veterinary medicine to reach more pets and their owners, thus revamping our profession, one student and one dog at a time. Thank you. Emily, thank you very much for sharing that personal story, taking us on your journey and bringing us your passion. Uh, Emily McCobb has been at the coming school since 1996. Thank you for your commitment to the school, Emily. Uh, someone she admires is Hillary Clinton and her favorite destination is any beach. So I think after some hard work, including the speech, uh, maybe Emily, you'll find some time to be at, at the beach. 
And just one more thing, as far as her experience at Cummings, uh, Emily has mentioned that she loves how pe the, the people and how they are not afraid to try new things. And working at the spray neuter clinic has been the highlight of her time here. Now on to our next speaker, and that is Dr. Fair Vassiler. Dr. Vassiler is an assistant professor in comparative path pathobiology at the Cummings School. Dr. Vassila is passionate about the opioid epidemic. Her rodent research uncovers, this is a mouthful, molecular changes that mediate opioid addiction and relapse, utilizing the behavioral model of self-administration and reinstatement to discover neural changes in both coding and non-coding RNA in rats. I would challenge anyone to repeat that sentence. But uh, to bring this more accessibly to you, her speech tonight is entitled, the past is present, the far-reaching impact of the opioid epidemic. Fair, the floor is yours. Thank you. I think at this point, most people are aware that the United States is in the midst of an opioid epidemic. Likely, many of you listening today have been personally affected by the consequences of this disease. Like I was when my best friend's sister died from a heroin overdose when we were in high school. Addiction touches the lives of many more people than just the individuals suffering with the disease. That's why finding novel treatments for addiction is a primary goal of my lab. But over the course of my research, I began to think more and more about how such widespread exposure to opioids might be impacting our society in ways that we haven't yet considered. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about my research looking at the effects of opioids across generations. My lab studies transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. What that means is that exposure to things like drugs in one generation can affect future children. When I first learned about this phenomenon, I was so surprised. I, 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 I knew we inherited DNA from our parents, one copy of a gene from our dad and one copy from our mom. I didn't know that additional factors could change the way those genes were expressed. I thought that the whole debate between nature and nurture or if our genes or our environment are more important in shaping the people that we become was related to the environment that we currently live in. But what if our parents' environment or even our grandparents' environment also played a role in shaping the people that we are. One of the first demonstrations of this phenomenon was in the Dutch winter famine of 1945. During this time, 4.5 million people were starving in Holland. This is one of the rare occasions when a famine occurred over a discrete period of time in a country that has nationalized health records. Because of this documentation, scientists were able to, to determine that women that were pregnant during the famine had children that were more susceptible to diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. This might not be surprising because the unborn baby was also exposed to severe undernutrition, but the effects of the famine also extended into the grandchildren. These children never experienced famine. They didn't even have differences in birth weight. And yet their grandmother's experience increased their risk for disease. In my research, I want to understand the impact of the widespread opioid exposure happening right now in the US. How is this gonna impact our future children or grandchildren? Is there something that we can learn that can help to protect, prevent serious consequences for these kids? Now, as you might imagine, these effects are really difficult to study in humans. Humans have a very long gestation period, they mature slowly, and their environments are wildly different. Rats, on the other hand, have a very short gestation period, mature slowly and experience identical environments in the lab setting. So I use rats to model what I cannot study in humans. In my studies, I have found that exposure to opioids for just 10 days during adolescence can change the behavior of future offspring. I'm not looking at prenatal exposure. I'm looking at exposure in male rats, just 10 days of opioid exposure when he is a teenager. 
Now, when he does go on to produce offspring later in adulthood, the female does all the rearing, which is normal for rat behavior. So even though the father never interacts with his offspring, we still see that his kids have increased likelihood to develop addiction-like behaviors. This is an effect that even extends into the grand offspring. Now, because I look at dads, rat dads, and the only thing they are contributing to their kids is sperm, I can begin to ask questions about how these things get passed across generations. I can measure changes in the sperm that show how the dad's environment was encoded in his genes and passed on to his offspring. Then I can try to understand how I can prevent this from passing on to the children. While this may seem dramatic or dire, the human situation is much more complex. I don't want you to leave here thinking that any dental procedure you had when you were younger where you might've been prescribed an opioid is gonna have a significant impact on your children or your grandchildren. What I want you to understand is that our environments and exposures can be encoded in our genes and passed on to our offspring, but it can have both positive and negative effects. With my research, I hope that I can identify biological systems that are vulnerable to the effects of opioids and develop treatment strategies to give everyone the best chances possible across generations. Thank you. Thank you, Fair. I should also sh uh, share uh, that uh, Dr. Fair Vassiler uh, has been a black belt in karate since the age of 16. And uh, so you don't want to mess with her. And, uh, but she does uh, love teaching her students. In fact, I have a quote here from uh, when I asked her about her Cummings experience. And she said, it's, it's such an amazing experience to provide a lecture for a large class and receive a personal note afterwards about how your lecture might have reached someone in a particular way. Sometimes it's difficult to understand if your words are reaching the students and when you receive feedback that they are, it's a wonderful feeling. She also loves mentoring students in the lab and watching students learn and grow in the lab setting. Fair, thank you very much. And uh, let's move on to our third speaker of the day. Another superstar coming up for you, and this is Dr. Vicky Yang. Uh, Dr. Yang is a research assistant professor at uh, the Cummings School. She's a former engineer turned veterinary cardiologist. Uh, so her research currently is in the field of cardio-oncology and is leading the way in determining cellular biomarkers that can help us catch and hopefully prevent cardiac tissue damage related to toxic oncology treatments. Though she studies companion animals, her research has particular relevance for pediatric cancer survivors who face lifetime cardiac issues as a result of their chemo treatments. Her talk tonight is entitled Connecting Companion, Animal, and Human Health Through the Heart. We're ready for you, Vicki. Thank you. So I will start my talk by showing you this image that I first saw in the National Geographic article. Typically, people would say, wow, that's so cute, but I'm a veterinary cardiologist with a background in engineering who is obsessed with the heart since the heart really is the most perfectly designed pump made by nature, and even engineers cannot recreate and unfortunately, my reaction is, oh, this little dog is going to get mitral valve disease. In fact, I tell my students that if you can pick up a dog with one arm, then that dog is going to get mitral valve disease. Somehow in the process of shrinking the size of a dog, we have inadvertently introduced this heart valve disease to the little guys. And at this point, you're probably wondering, what is this mitral valve disease she keeps talking about? So this is an aging disease where as our dogs get older, for some unknown reason, the main heart valve starts to deform and leak. To put it in perspective, imagine that your basement water pump springs a leak and it's no longer pumping water effectively. And in fact, you're going to have a bad flood in your basement. So the same thing happens to the heart, except now the flooding is in your lungs and no one can breathe well when there's flooding in the lungs. Unfortunately, there is no cure for this disease and we only have medication to manage the flood. It's a terrible conversation I have to have with dog owners over and over again, telling them I have nothing for them and I can only buy them some time. So this is the motivation for my research. I want to find out why the heart valve starts deforming so we can prevent it from happening. Right now, no one's been able to figure out which specific gene is at the root of the problem, which makes us think 
if it's not actually the fault of one gene, but perhaps how it's being controlled. And this is a unique perspective that my research is taking on our investigation. One ubiquitous gene regulator called microRNA can decide which gene to translate into actual biological function and which ones to ignore. So it becomes a problem with the microRNA is dysfunctional and starts to read out the bad genes while ignoring the good ones. And then you end up with deformed mitral valve. You can also imagine that if we can identify which microRNA has gone rogue and block it, we can prevent mitral valve disease in dogs. And this is what my research lab is trying to do. And you'll hear a lot more about genes in the next talk by Dr. Heather Burke. As it turns out, the same mitral valve disease happened in people. Their advantage is that they have open heart surgery to fix a valve. Yet we all know that healthcare is more efficient with disease prevention rather than expensive treatment. So just like us, human cardiologists are also working towards understanding the cause of this valve disease. My lab has therefore partnered with scientists studying human condition, sharing information to identify specific microRNA involved in the mitral valve disease. And this is a long held concept that again, you'll hear about in later talks. I am uh, sharing my next slide again to let you know that I have not forgotten about our big dogs in my research. Unfortunately, a lot of our big dogs end up with cancer. As a cardiologist, I get involved when the cancer treatment ends up hurting the heart. This is such a common problem. For example, in people, second to recurrence of cancer, heart disease is the most common cause of death or poor quality of life in cancer survivors. Heart injuries from cancer treatment has become such an important problem that in human hospitals, they have created a new discipline called cardio-oncology. And just like their human counterparts, our pet dogs are treated with the same cancer drugs. So not unexpectedly, they can also develop heart problems after cancer treatment. It is extremely frustrating when you finally conquer cancer and now you're dealing with heart disease because of your treatment. So my research lab together with researchers, clinicians at Tufts Medical Center and our own oncologists want to better understand how these heart injuries occur so we can prevent it to develop new imaging technique or markers to detect injury, injury sooner so that damages can be reversed and to find drugs that can prevent injuries from happening in the first place. Our common goal is to give cancer survivors, whether human, dogs, or cat, the chance for a quality of life they have fought for so bravely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vicki Yang, for that enlightening and interesting talk. Uh, speaking of interesting, while Dr. Yang works primarily with dogs, she actually loves cats. Uh, I wish we could do a, a survey to see how many cat people are there versus the dog people. But uh, Vicky, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Yang has uh, actually grew up in Taiwan, but her favorite destination is the uh, Scottish Highlands. And uh, one of the, the things that she would like to change uh, about the world is to get rid of racism. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yang, on, uh, for your talk and also for sharing uh, your, your work with, uh, you know, with us here in the community for so long. Uh, now we move on to our fourth speaker for the day, and that is Dr. Heather Gardner. Dr. Gardner is uh, the Assistant Research Professor in the Department of Clinical Sciences and uh, currently a member of the Clinical Trials Office Team. Uh, she studies the genetic makeup of tumors to develop novel therapeutic treatments as a comparative and translational trans trans oncologist. I've got that right. I do not have a science background, so please pardon me. Uh, her work spans veterinary and human medicine. And she has an interesting title for us today, and that is Cancer, the Power of a Typo. Heather Gardner here for you. Thank you, Mihir. So how many people use their phone to send a text message today? Probably most of us, right? Now, I don't know about you, but my text messages often have typos or sometimes my phone autocorrects and just throws the wrong word in there. Now, most of the time, these typos are pretty small and you can still understand what I'm trying to say, but other times, they're a bit bigger and they can completely change the meaning of the message that I'm sending someone. 
In DNA, these typos are called mutations, and they're very common in diseases like cancer. Just like my text message, some of these typos are relatively small, and they don't change the instructions that a cell might receive. But others can be much larger. And when that happens, the, the message that a cell gets can be altered, and that can cause the cells to behave differently and maybe more aggressively than they otherwise would have. Now, we all know that cancer is common in people. Millions of people fight this disease every day. But what you might not be aware of is that animals develop many of the same cancers that people do, and they're often just as common. As a veterinary medical oncologist, I treat animals with cancer using many of the same anti-cancer drugs that a person might give. But for over three decades, our strategy for treating cancer really hasn't changed a whole lot. We give a chemotherapy drug to try and kill the cancer cells. And this approach works pretty well for a lot of cancers. While we don't commonly cure cancer in our veterinary patients, they do respond to treatment and are able to spend some extra good quality time with us. But not all cancers respond the same way to therapy. Why does treatment work for some dogs with bone cancer better than it does for others? What makes cancer in the bone different from cancer in the spleen or the heart? So I want you to think about your thumb for a minute. Just like my thumbprint is unique from all of yours, one of the things that makes cancer in one person different from cancer in another person is its genomic fingerprint. This fingerprint contains all of the genes that give instructions to cells, basically just telling them what to do, kind of like the words in a sentence. Think about it, your words are made up of a series of letters and your genes are made up of a genetic alphabet. And just like my text messages, your DNA isn't perfect. Sometimes it makes mistakes. Extra letters or words can be added in or deleted. So then what if we could identify those typos in cancer and give a drug that specifically targets those mutations? Well, as you might expect, this approach works well in some cases, but in other cancers, that same drug might not work as well, even if both tumors have the same mutation. Now, the reasons for this can be complicated, but it really boils down to two big overarching issues. The first is that cancer is just unpredictable. Not all mutations change the instructions that a cancer cell gets, and we're really only beginning to understand which mutations are the most important for determining if cancer will spread in the body or if it will respond to treatment. The second issue is that cancer can occur anywhere in the body. And a lot of the time it pops up in places that are hard for us to biopsy. And this is really important because if we can't get a piece of that cancer, then we don't know what its DNA fingerprint looks like. Now, something that's really interesting is that cancer can release pieces of its DNA into the blood. And by using advanced sequencing techniques to determine the order of letters in the cancer DNA and pinpoint those typos, we're beginning to identify the genomic fingerprint of cancer simply by taking a blood sample. And these strategies are useful for helping us to identify better treatment options for patients. We can compare the fingerprint of cancer in the blood to the fingerprint of the actual tumor from the time that it's first diagnosed to the time that it spreads somewhere else in the body, such as the lungs. Now, unlike my fingerprint, the fingerprint of cancer changes over time. And by understanding how this occurs, we're working to identify better treatment options for patients. And maybe most importantly, we can study how that unique genomic fingerprint affects how normal cells in the body interact with cancer cells during the course of therapy. All you have to do is look at your phone to realize that there are a lot of things we do differently now than we did three decades ago. I'm motivated to accelerate discoveries that can lead to new treatments for cancer because for many of the cancers that we see, just like bone cancer, the prognosis hasn't changed for years. And that next discovery in a veterinary patient could not only improve the outcome for man's best friend, but could also be the thing that helps save your life or the life of a loved one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. Some trivia for you is that uh, growing up, Heather's dad was in the army and she lived all over. She grew up all over the country. Uh, she has a bunch of hobbies, swimming, skiing, piano, and photography. And, you know, her favorite part of being at Cummings is working with a supportive group of peers.
Uh, once again, thank you, Heather, for that speech. From Heather, we are going to Claire Fellman, and Claire Fellman is currently the Assistant Professor in Small Animal Internal Medicine and Clinical Pharmacology. Uh, her research is focused on antimicrobial stewardship, the alarming rise of antibiotic resistance, and targeted studies to determine overuse in treatment like kidney disease. Now, Claire's speech is entitled, Pets in Our Homes, a priority for responsible antibiotic use. Please, Dr. Feldman. Thank you, Mahir. I'm gonna tell you a story. In September of 1928, a slightly careless scientist returned from a restful two week vacation to find two things growing on what should have been a sterile bacterial culture plate. The first was the bacteria Staphylococcus and the second was fuzzy white mold. When he looked more closely, he realized that mold was inhibiting growth of the bacteria and in so doing, accidentally discovered the world's first antibiotic. That scientist was Sir Alexander Fleming and the mold was producing something I think you've heard of before, which was penicillin. This sparked a revolution in modern medicine and over the following decades, dozens of antibiotics were discovered. But less than 100 years later, they say we are already entering the post-antibiotic era. Now, bacteria have de developed ways to avoid being killed by antibiotics, something called antibiotic resistance. So these life-saving drugs may no longer work as well for the infections they once did. Each year, 700,000 people die from antibiotic resistant infections. Human hospitals have tackled this crisis through developing antibiotic stewardship programs. Antibiotic stewardship is the concept of using antibiotics responsibly and only when needed. And programs accomplish their goals by distributing guidelines for best use, having pharmacists provide advice, and tracking prescriptions of important drugs. This sort of thing is right up my alley. I grew up in a medical home. My father was a doctor and my mother was a pharmacist. But dad always said if he could do it again, he would have become a veterinarian. I listened to his advice and went to vet school, and probably because of my mother's influence, became a veterinary pharmacologist. I was so excited when I came to Tufts five years ago and learned there was a One Health team already in place starting to work on antibiotic use in dogs and cats. One Health is the concept that our world is shared by plants, humans, and animals, and strategies successful in one field can inform approaches in others. Our One Health team consists of veterinarians from the Cummings School and doctors and a pharmacist from Tufts Medical Center. And together, our goal is to bring successful strategies from human medicine to companion animal practice. This approach is actually pretty unique. To date, most of the work in veterinary stewardship has focused on farm animals because that's where the majority of antibiotic prescriptions occur. But farm animals don't live in your homes, your pets do. There's increasing recognition that antibiotic use in any member of the home changes the bacteria found in the humans and animals living there. And research, including some of my own studies, has identified the direct transmission of antibiotic resistant organisms between pets and their owners. Despite this, judicious antibiotic use has only recently gained attention as a need and a priority in companion animal medicine. I'm proud to tell you though, that Tufts has launched a small animal antibiotic stewardship program. I'd like to share with you more about one of our efforts. One of the biggest challenges in veterinary stewardship is that right now, we don't even know how many antibiotics are being used in dogs and cats. We can come up with many strategies to improve prescribing, but if we can't measure their impact, it's really difficult to design an effective program. This problem is compounded by the fact that some veterinarians use paper records and others use a variety of electronic medical record systems. To address this, we have developed a tool that extracts antibiotic prescription information from electronic medical record systems. To use an analogy, if your hospital spoke French and my hospital spoke German, this tool would translate us both to English so we can directly compare medical records information. Using this tool, we've already extracted antibiotic prescription data from patients at the Foster Hospital and are working to evaluate areas with frequent antibiotic use to determine if those prescriptions are appropriate. 
We're working on expanding this tool to other universities and will then branch out into a network of private practices. Our goal is to be able to automatically capture medical records information so that we can report back to veterinarians how their antibiotic use compares to other vets in similar situations. Though I love this program and what I'm working on, I didn't actually come to Tufts to be a researcher. I came to be a teacher. I'm most excited about this work because I'm teaching veterinarians and veterinary students about the need to use antibiotics wisely for humans and animals. I know that with each person we reach, they will help spread a message that will preserve the utility of these life-saving drugs for generations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, so for, with Claire Feldman, uh, we've been talking about quite a bit of travel. So Claire's father was also in the Air Force. And so she has lived overseas twice and visited over 25 countries. And, uh, you know, what she uh, shares about herself is she's, she's also a pharmacologist. And uh, they may know that you may know that she's a clinician in the small and animal, small animal internal medicine uh, service team, but, but also uh, takes pride in her background in pharmacology. Uh, three words that she uses to describe herself are genuine, dedicated, and mother. Okay, from, from Claire, we shall move on to Dr. Marika Rosenbaum. Okay, Dr. Marika Rosenbaum, also very interesting research uh, around rodents, but her qualification currently is that she's, uh, she's the assistant professor in infectious disease and global health. Uh, Dr. Rosenbaum is trained in veterinary medicine and public health. She studies health and disease in the context of human animal relationships, as I think several of our researchers here today do. And specifically, she's looking at the interface of humans and wildlife, like in wet markets or cohabitation with production animals. Thank you so much, Mihir. Let me show you what I see. It's 2 a.m. and you're walking down an alley. There's trash everywhere. Chicken bones, wrappers, bottles of all kinds, tattered clothing and rags, feces, debris. People are combing through the trash and looking for usable items to bring back to the slab of cement that they're temporarily squatting on for the night. One man uses a snow shovel to clear a path through the trash to his tent. You stop and observe. As your eyes adjust, you appreciate rats, dozens of them scurrying across the street, searching through the trash and darting around the people, including you standing in the middle of their habitat, their home. These are brown or Norway rats, scientifically referred to as ratus norvegicus. They're urban exploiters who thrive in the cracks of our forgotten buildings and the trash of our lives, who persist in our urban centers solely because our species, Homo sapiens, provide shelter and food to support their populations. In this context, could a disease jump from a rat to a human and then cause a pandemic? That is the million dollar question, the needle in the haystack. How can we prevent the next global pandemic like the one we're experiencing now, an event of such magnitude that's actually quite rare compared to the transmission of bacteria and viruses that is constantly occurring between us, our environment, and other species like the rats among us. Just like a virus that circulates, causes the common cold circulates in a room full of toddlers, bacteria and viruses are also circulating amongst the other species of animals that we share an urban habitat with. And some of these bacteria and viruses can jump from animals to humans and cause disease called the zoonoses. What risk does this pose to humans and the ecosystems we live in? Can we better understand when and why a bacteria or a virus from one species like the rat gets transmitted to another species, the human race? Can we detect and learn from these patterns to protect vulnerable populations? That is the focus of my research. Now, since I've been talking about rats and disease, your skin may already be crawling as you recount the infamous Black Death or Plague 
caused by the bacteria Yersinia pestis, which was transmitted from rats to humans by fleas and which claimed the lives of over 75 million people. Clearly, our health is influenced by the rats that we share an urban habitat with. And we can learn about ways to improve public health by studying the rats among us. Less well known is another species of bacteria, Leptospira, which can infect humans and animals and cause a range of clinical symptoms, ranging from asymptomatic infection to multi-system organ failure and death. These images depict the spiral-shaped bacteria, or spirochete, in a rat's kidney. We know from our research that pathogenic leptospira are circulating right here in Boston. We've tested over 250 rats and found that about 20% of them are carrying the bacteria that causes leptospirosis in humans. And these images that you see here come from Boston rats. Time to freak out. Not really. Rats, along with other mammals, are considered a reservoir for leptospirosis, which means that the bacteria normally lives, grows, and multiplies in rats. But we, you and I, we have a floor under our feet. We have a roof over our Zoom screen. Despite the fact that rats live amongst us, and yes, they likely live around your home if you're living in an urban center, we do not have extensive contact with them. But what about highly vulnerable human populations living on the streets, which places them at elevated risk for contact with rodents? Areas where sanitation is poor, where buildings are unkempt, where pavement predominates and city residents avoid. Our group is working now to understand the risk of leptospirosis transmission from rats to humans living in an urban environment. We are studying the built and environmental parameters like poor sanitation, precipitation, and temperature that favor the, favor the growth and persistence of the bacteria. And we're studying the different species of leptospira that are present in the rats in this area. This is important information required to develop effective vaccines against leptospirosis for us and our companion animals. Finally, we hope to extend our surveillance to vulnerable human populations to increase our understanding of the burden of this historically neglected disease in the United States, which anecdotally is increasing in humans and dogs, and which will likely increase as climate change drives warm weather, precipitation, and flooding, all parameters that contribute to the persistence of leptospirosis in urban environments. How are we doing this? We creep through alleys at night and trap rats. We set up field stations to collect our samples. We use tools, including remote sensing devices and geospatial analysis, like the map you see on this slide, and whole genome sequencing to generate our data and understand our results. And most importantly, we spend time in the field observing our surroundings to better understand the context of the urban ecosystem we are studying and to answer some of the questions I have posed for you today. So maybe the, next, whoop, maybe the next time you see a rat scurrying through the street, you'll ponder what can be learned to improve our health by studying the rats among us. Thank you. Marika, thank you very much for that speech and indeed entitled The Rats Among Us, Disease Transmission from Animals to Humans. Thank you also for taking us on a journey through your research as it stands right now and what you hope to study in the future. Uh, Dr. Marika Rosenbaum is someone who enjoys being outside in nature and uh, her favorite experience about the coming school is working with veterinary and master's students to learn about and conduct transdisciplinary research. She also loves good food, food music and yoga. Next up, is Dr. Maureen Murray. We're also we're going to stay on the, the topic of rodents. Uh, Dr. Murray, Murray is a clinical assistant professor and director of the Tufts Wildlife Clinic. In addition to overseeing our busy wildlife medicine clinic and working in conservation, Dr. Murray is also a leading voice in the study of rodenticide use and the resulting widespread exposure of birds of prey. Her title is our rodent problems are not ours alone, the effects of anticoagulant rodenticides on birds of prey. 
Great, thank you very much. When you hear the word anticoagulant, I'm guessing most of you think of a life-saving, blood-thinning medication and that you would not immediately think of rodent poisons. The anticoagulant rodenticides are a group of rodent poisons that include and are related to the drug warfarin, a commonly used blood thinner. It might surprise you to know that warfarin was used as a rodent poison before it was used medically. It might also surprise you to know that if you are in Massachusetts and you spot a red-tailed hawk as you're driving along the Mass Pike, the chances of that hawk having been exposed to an anticoagulant rodenticide are very, very high. And there's also a fair chance of that hawk bleeding to death due to that exposure. This problem has been the focus of my research as a wildlife veterinarian. In people with certain medical conditions, a drug that makes the blood clot a little slower is beneficial, but a toxic dose of an anticoagulant in the form of a rodent poison is designed to prevent the blood from clotting at all. For the past several decades across the world, the anticoagulant rodenticides, and especially a newer category called the second generation anticoagulant rodenticides, have been the weapon of choice in humans' ongoing battle with rats and mice. What's the problem with them? After an animal, any animal, ingests that poison bait, the active chemical in that bait is stored in their liver. If a predator, such as a red-tailed hawk, then preys on that first animal, the hawk has also just ingested that active poison. I went to vet school specifically to become a wildlife veterinarian because I wanted to give back to these animals that are so often negatively affected by human activity. My research on anticoagulant rodenticides, which I'll just call ARs from now on, came directly out of my work in the clinic where I have cared for numerous hawks and other birds of prey that have consumed a toxic dose of an AR. You're looking at a photo of a red-tailed hawk that's feeling well She's showing us that she is the boss. And this is a red-tailed hawk with AR toxicosis that someone saw fall out of a tree because she was no longer able to perch. She's too weak to stand or even react to our presence because of how much blood she's lost. We can try to treat these birds, but we are not always successful. I wanted to find out how common it was that the birds of prey coming into the clinic were in fact exposed to these rodenticides. From 2011 to 2020, I've published three separate studies that have sampled almost 300 hawks and owls from across the state, including the four species you're seeing in this photo. I found that a high proportion of birds were positive for residues of second generation ARs in particular. They weren't all necessarily showing signs of excessive bleeding, but they had been exposed. Across these three studies, the percentage of exposed birds has increased from 86% to 96% to most recently 100%. So what does this mean? It means that these rodenticides are getting into the food chain and bioaccumulating up to those animals at the top of the chain. Do they kill individual wild animals? Yes. I've seen birds die in front of me and I've even had them die in my hands as I'm trying to treat them. How many wild animals do these poisons kill and are they having effects on populations? This is something that's just very hard to study, so we don't have an answer to that question. Is this extensive exposure alone, however, reason enough to rethink our approach to rodent control? I would say yes. Does anyone remember during the shutdowns early in the COVID-19 pandemic when the CDC issued a warning about aggressive rats wandering the streets in search of food? This happened because restaurants and stores were closed. The dumpsters and trash cans the rats would regularly visit were empty, so they were looking elsewhere for food. There may be no better example of how human behavior drives rodent behavior. We, collectively as a species, have a rodent problem. The goals of my ongoing research are to understand the environmental risks of these rodenticides and to investigate the routes they're taking through the food chain in order to help find ways to protect our wildlife. 
Public health concerns related to rats and mice remain a real issue today, as my colleague, Dr. Rosenbaum, just so powerfully demonstrated. There's no question that we need to control populations of these rodents, but we very much need to question how we control populations of these rodents. All of us as individuals and communities can play a role in solving this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Maureen Murray. Maureen, uh, has a top hobby is running. Her favorite destination is her house. Uh, she says, said that her coming school experience so far has been ever changing. And her, her favorite experience so far at the school is seeing students develop an interest in wildlife medicine. Thank you very much, uh, Maureen, for your talk. Okay, we have actually come now to our last speaker of the day. A little bit of a background for the speaker, Dr. Mandy Martineau, who is currently an assistant professor at Cummings. Uh, Dr. Martineau is a rising star in the Department of Infectious Disease and Global Health. She is a board certified veterinary pathologist. She was part of the team that developed the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. And her research has focused a great deal on tuberculosis. She is an expert in animal modeling, in fact, for infectious disease pathology and leverages new technologies such as cyclic immunofluorescence. Now her speech today is entitled, and it's an alliteration and a tongue twister, Vetting Vaccines of Veterinarians' Role in Global Health Research. Please take it away, Dr. Martineau. Thank you, Mahir. Daughters often idolize their fathers. My father is the smartest, hardest working man I know, and he is a veterinarian. He has always told me that veterinarians can do anything. So at the age of 14, I decided to follow my father's footsteps. Today, I'm a veterinarian and a scientist working at the interface of, of human and animal health. I am leveraging veterinary medicine to solve human health problems. Now, my dad is a small animal veterinarian, but I knew early on that I wanted something different. I wanted to have a global impact. I wanted to make the world a better, healthier place for animals and people. When I went to veterinary school at first, I really struggled to find my niche, but then I began to interact with veterinarians and scientists engaged in global health research. And at that moment, I began to truly realize just how limitless the possibilities were for me, and perhaps for all of you, for making a difference in my chosen career path. Ultimately, I decided to tackle one of the greatest global health challenges of all time finding ways to combat tuberculosis or TB in people. Now, many of you may be familiar with disease tuberculosis or otherwise known as consumption as it's portrayed here or in period piece films such as the Moulin Rouge where there is a sickly heroine with a chronic cough with blood. Those depictions are not exaggerations. TB is a debilitating lung disease, not unlike cancer where not only do the lungs slowly fill with infection, preventing the person from breathing, but also causing a terrible wasting disease. Currently, one third of the world's population or over 2 billion people are either actively or latently infected with tuberculosis. And TB causes a quarter of all HIV related deaths. Even a marginally effective vaccine would help millions. For this reason, I decided to focus my research on TB vaccine development. You know, it's funny, before I came to Tufts, it never ceased to amaze me just how perplexed people would be when I would tell them that I was doing research on tuberculosis. They would give me sort of a funny look and say, oh, for animals? No, I would say for people. I'm doing research to understand how the bacterium, mycobacterium tuberculosis makes people sick research to understand why it is so hard to treat TB with antibiotics and why TB can persist in our bodies for a lifetime. Now you might be asking yourself, isn't there already a vaccine for tuberculosis? And the answer is yes, there is. It's called BCG, but for reasons that we don't completely understand, it doesn't work as well in, in adults. It primarily works in children while the burden of TB disease occurs in adults. I'm trying to understand why BCG works by studying bacterial DNA so that I can make a better TB vaccine. 
Bacteria are just like people. They have a genetic code and that genetic code or the TB genome holds the clues to the bacteria's arsenal for causing illness, otherwise known as its virulence genes. My research focuses on understanding the virulence genes that allows TB to persist in the body despite an otherwise strong immune response or the body's first defense. By understanding TB's virulence genes, I hope to be able to design a vaccine that can hit TB in its weakest spot. And I have one superpower that helps me do this job a little bit easier, the power of pathology. As a veterinary comparative pathologist, my job is to understand how disease affects all species, including humans. By understanding how disease in animals and humans are different or similar, I can then help decide if a vaccine is working in animals and help others decide whether that vaccine should be tested in people. The best part about this is that I can use this toolkit not only for TB vaccines, but for any vaccine. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, I was able to pivot my research toolkit towards evaluating the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. I have to say, I am extremely proud to have contributed to COVID-19 vaccine development. If you would have told me when I decided to become a veterinarian that I was going to be working on diseases such as tuberculosis or COVID-19, I probably wouldn't have believed you. But it's true. Veterinarians can do anything. Veterinarians all over the world are helping animals, people, and the planet. Right here at Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine, veterinarians and researchers alike are helping not only our companion animals, but also the environment. They're helping secure our food supply and protecting our wildlife. And maybe a veterinarian will even make a TB vaccine one day or help stop COVID-19. One thing's for sure, this veterinarian is going to try. Thank you. As I said, today is a day about researchers and their research, and they have brought it alive to you in five minutes each. Uh, Mandy Martineau, thank you for your five minutes of magic. A uh, little trivia on, on, on her is that Mandy admires Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The late Ruth Bader Ginsburg was an inspiration for her. Her favorite destination is Paris, and her Cummings experience so far has been like drinking from a water hose, but very refreshing nevertheless. So there you have it, eight researchers and their research. Before I hand it over to uh, Dr. London, I do want to thank the alumni and advancement team. Thank you uh, all of you for really just phenomenal talks. I'm so proud of all of you and so excited to see what you'll bring in the future. Um, and uh, to all the people that are, are still with us, I want to thank you. Uh, you really uh, helped make this evening successful. You've made generous contributions to fund the programs discussed this evening. And there are many other important avenues of discovery across our school that we'd love you to become familiar with. Uh, this work is really not possible without philanthropy from individuals, foundations, and corporations who are partners and friends in our mission to heal animals, help people, and change lives. I would encourage anyone who is interested in learning more about our research enterprise and ways to help uh, to visit our website or to reach out to the advancement team through the links in the chat box. Thank you again and feel free to send emails to the participants with additional questions if you have them. Uh, and uh, have a great night. Thank you again. <laughs>